Well, men, welcome to our second week of the Master Plan of Evangelism. This is our second part of the Level 2 first semester study, and we're excited to be actually getting into the material. First week was introductory to our topic, and this week we want to start talking about those principles. So uh, if you haven't looked at the book yet that we're using for the semester, this one by Robert Coleman, this is our supplementary material. So if you haven't looked at this yet or you haven't gotten one yet, do that today and go ahead and read the intro pieces and that first chapter. Uh, that's where we're going to be today is diving into the actual first chapter of the book and looking at the same concept and idea. Again, uh, the goal is not for me to do a book review or teach you all the material in the book. I'll make references to it. We'll quote from it some. Uh, the material there is our, our guide, but the goal is to bring to light in our live lecture uh, some ideas, material, scripture references to supplement the concept. And so between the book and between the live teaching and your group discussion, we hope you get a really full grasp of what we want you to gain by having this study together. So just a couple of reminders, the master plan of evangelism is the master's plan. So focus on those words, the master's plan, not just on evangelism. It's not a method or a technique. It's about a person. It's about following Jesus, the person of Jesus and using his strategy. So not a method, not a technique, a person and a strategy. That's the focus. And so that's why I say focus on the words, the master's plan of evangelism. And so thinking about where uh, Dr. Coleman goes with his book, the first strategy that he presents to us, or the first principle, you may want to say it that way, is selection. And so I want to take us to John chapter 1, verse 35. He references a few of these verses in John 1 in that first chapter. I want to read for you uh, this context of Jesus early ministry. It says, again, the next day John was standing with two of his disciples, talking about John the Baptist, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, so late in the day. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon's Peter, brother. He found first his own brother Simon and said to him, We found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip, and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We've found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. These are verses that are probably familiar to you. Uh, the early part of John's Gospel, Jesus is, is beginning to call these disciples out of this village and village area around the Sea of Galilee, uh, primarily fishermen, and, and he's calling them to follow him. This is early in the ministry where He's not really uh, appointing them into any kind of apostleship at this point. He's just call, calling disciples, those who are showing an interest and a desire, those who seem to be hungering 
for uh, God and His work and His move and the kingdom. And Jesus is calling them to follow Him. And you see this calling that takes place. We've read through these verses of, of here, comes, here comes one and, and, and He brings another and, and Jesus calls Him and, and, and He brings another. And, and you begin to see the gathering of these disciples. Uh, you, you probably uh, think about uh, you know, this, this calling and what are they doing? Why are they coming? What, what, what's the purpose? What, what's happening here? What is Jesus calling them to? Uh, when we think about selection, we need to stop and, and, and remember the mission. Uh, uh, that's, that's really what we're thinking about, the mission. What's the mission? What are we doing? You, you might remember the opening to uh, any of the Mission Impossible series. And, when I, when, I meant, when I mentioned Mission Impossible series, you, you might think about the movie series, multiple movies that have come out and, and are supposed to have more coming out. Um, but when I think about Mission Impossible, I think about the original TV series from the late 1960s and early 70s and that then played on reruns for several years following. And, uh, at the opening of all of the TV series, Mission Impossible, and, and uh, of the ones I've seen in the movie series, you, you get a flavor of the same thing. But uh, the, there, there's a, a tape recording uh, in the old series, and uh, there is, there's a voice on the tape recording, and, and it says, your mission if you choose to accept it, right? Uh, and then it gives, this is what's going on, this is what you've got to accomplish, this is what your team is supposed to, supposed to do. Uh, the stolen plan you're supposed to recover, the person you're supposed to rescue, right? But your mission, should you choose to accept it? Well, do we understand our mission? Good morning, Mr. Phelps. Your mission, Jim, should you decide to accept it, is to make Stefan believe Townsend's information. As always, should you or any of your IM force be caught or killed, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of your actions. The state will self-destruct in five seconds. Do we know what these principles we're about to study are all for, right? We're studying eight principles. Well, what are they for? What do these principles guide us to do? Well, go back and look at the introductory week. It kind of lays out uh, this is what the mission is about, but uh, to keep you from just having to go back, let me state this to you here. This isn't out of your book. This is from another book called What is the Mission of the Church? A book that Kevin DeYoung and Greg Gilbert authored together, co-authored. They wrote this, the mission of the church is to go into the world and make disciples by declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit and gathering these disciples into churches that they might worship the Lord and obey His commands now and in eternity the glory of God the Father. That's the mission of the church. Go in the world, make disciples. How do we do that? Declaring the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit so that disciples can be gathered into churches and they can worship the Lord and obey His commands from now on into eternity. And in obeying those commands means going about and doing the same thing again, right? Repeating the process, reproduction. For Jesus, the mission was clear that all the world might be saved. He came to be the Savior of the world. He came that the world might be saved. Uh, when we think about the mission of the church, we usually speak of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which says, uh, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And, lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. So the mission of the church, the Great Commission, is make disciples of all nations. How do we make disciples? Uh, baptize them, teach them, all right? And when you're teaching them, what you're doing is you're explaining and training how to perpetuate, again, the mission of the church. To do the mission, to fulfill the mission means train more people. To do the mission, fulfill the mission again and again, knowing the mission. It, and, and understanding the strategy that has been laid out for us is what we're all about, what we're doing. The strategy given to us by Jesus begins with selection. That's principle number one. That's where we are today, selection. Think about John 1 again. Uh, listen, Jesus, as he starts his earthly ministries, he's not concerning himself with programs, right? He didn't show up and go, okay, 
here's our program. Here's, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to get this, this done. He focused on people. He began to call people. He gathered a few followers first before he had ever preached a sermon or before he had ever organized any kind of evangelistic effort. Jesus is gathering some people. John and Andrew are called. Andrew brings Peter. Philip is called. Philip brings Nathaniel. Right? There's a few people beginning to gather to him as, as Jesus starts this evangelistic me method strategy with selection. It's months later when the fishermen are recalled. These fishermen are gathered to him. And then there's more kind of an official call later, but they're recalled. And, and that's the time Matthew gathers in and, and, and others are brought into this band of men. And, and, and not much longer, there's kind of a commissioning where they're set aside as his disciples and he gives them uh, the work to do and sends them out. And, right? and, then, and then it's by the end of his ministry, uh, they're, they're his apostles. But it's a few and it's a selection process. And, and it's a men. And, and listen, the, these men do not seem to be the likely prospects for world domination, right? Uh, Jesus is gathering people to change the world. And you look at the gathering and you go, is this, is this it? Is this what we're going to do, right? They're not from the wealthy class. They're not from the religious elite. They're not from the politically connected they're not from the culturally informed. They're not from the intellectually admired, right? Uh, you look out across the spheres of our world, the spheres of even the ancient world, and you go, okay, we need to get it. We need to get a cross section of the movers and shakers, the people that can, that can get some things done, and they don't seem to be those men. They're, they're men from the average cross section of the society. But these are men that sincerely yearned for God. They had a sincere yearning for the kingdom of God, for the move of God. They were looking for the Messiah. They, they were able to see and, and, and understand, not, not clearly and not fully and not even consistently, but they had the idea, this man is sent from God and he's got God's mission and God's word. This is where we need to be. When, when we talk about uh, those that you might want to select, we're talking about selection. Sometimes we use the, the acronym FAT, choose people who are fat, faithful, available, teachable. Uh, they showed themselves to be those kinds of men. But I, I, listen, I'd rather, I'd rather use this terminology. I'd, I'd rather use this acronym. So think with me about this acronym, uh, APT. These were apt men, A-P-T, apt. The word apt means to be prepared, to be ready, and to be willing. These were apt men. They're, they're prepared, they're ready, they're willing. They're, they're not fully prepared, they're not fully trained, but they're prepared, right? There, there were things in their background that made them capable of joining Jesus on this journey, on this mission, on this quest. And they were ready, right? They, 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 they come, they come. They, they throw aside the nets, they leave behind their past, and they go, and they're willing. So al allow, allow the words, that's the definition, allow the letters of APT, A-P-T, to stand for availability, passionate, and teachable. We understand availability when we talk about faithful, available, teacher, teachable, we, we get that, but uh, availability. Uh, you cannot be chosen for leadership if you're not available, if you're not present. There's a, there's a joke in, in most church circles that the quickest way to get elected to be the chairman of any committee is miss a meeting, right? Uh, if you don't show up, you're going to be selected to be the leader. Well, that may be the joke, but that's not the best way to choose a leader. That's not the way you choose leaders in, in the world, right? You don't choose the people that don't show, right? I, you need the people that show up. You want, you want leadership. If you're involved in an organization or a group, and, and it's struggling to find leadership, and you're thinking, man, I know what we need to do, but no one seems to be. Listen, you show up, you be available, you be around, you be present, you be asking questions. How can I help? What can I do? You be present. Present people, available people, are, are given opportunities to lead, to have influence. You, you may, listen, you may not be the elected leader, okay, but you have the ability to have 
influence, availability. I want to be used, right? If you want that, start being available. Spiritually, that's the hard attitude of just letting yourself be used of God in any way that He wants to use you. So availability. And we understand teachable, right? That we, that we understand that, that word. Am I willing to, to admit my shortcomings? Am I willing to hear about my own blind spots? Am I willing to receive critique and, and then adjust according to the critique? Or, or am I an individual that, I, man, I, I excuse away all criticisms that might come my way? You know, well, I, listen, I, I was just having a bad day. Or, uh, well, you know, I'm just really off my game today. I don't know what's wrong with me today. Or, you, no one gave me the information I needed to be successful. This isn't my fault. Somebody else didn't give me what I needed. Somebody else didn't do their part, right? But the teachable person is humble and they're ready to learn. Hey, what, what else can I do to be better? How, how come that didn't work out the way that I thought it would? Or, you know what, I, I made that error. How can we do that better next time? A teachable person. They're not afraid to try and fail and then learn from their mistakes. And man, we watch the disciples in their service of the Lord. And there's mistakes. But of these groups, group of men... As they walk with Jesus, they stay there, right? They continue to learn. They continue to listen. They continue to just allow themselves to be pressed into humility to follow the Lord. They're teachable. They're available and they're teachable. But then I didn't use the word faithful. I chose the word passionate. Available, passionate, teachable. What, why did I use passionate instead of Faithful. Well, faithful is a good word. I, I don't want to say don't use that word, but I want to connect Paul's life and this idea of faithful, passionate together. He was faithful. Paul was a faithful man. The disciples showed themselves to be faithful. But what Paul, made, what made Paul, excuse me, willing to suffer so much for the gospel? You, if we look at Paul's life here, here's a servant of God who was just so faithful in suffering, right? He stayed with the game. He stuck out the mission under shipwreck, under torture, under constant hunting him down, under trials and f fake trials and all kinds of beatings and persecutions Paul suffered. And he just remained there. What made Paul so faithful to what God was doing and, and, and you might just look at it and go, here's the deal. I think Paul was just more faithful than I could ever be. He just, he's just more faithful. But it, listen, it's not that he was just more faithful. He was more passionate about Christ than we are. He's just more passionate. Paul loved the Lord Jesus and loved the gospel and wanted all to hear the message of the good news and was willing regardless of what the enemy threw at him, and whatever came his way, I, I'm just not going to give up on this. He had a passion for Christ. Now, I want you to look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. This verse tells us that religious commitment, right, circumcision, or a lack of religious commitment, uncircumcision, has nothing to do with our salvation. Your circumcision or uncircumcision has nothing to do, right? It, means, it doesn't mean anything, Paul says, right? It, it doesn't mean anything. Your religious commitment or lack of religious commitment doesn't mean anything, but faith working through love, a faith that proves itself in love, a faith that evidences itself in love, Passionate faith in Christ fuels a life that loves others enough to bring the gospel to them in meaningful, personal, creative ways. Paul was passionate. He had, listen, he was faithful. He had a faith working through love. Faith that evidenced itself in love. Faith that showed itself, proved itself in his love. He loved the gospel and he loved the Lord and he wanted people to know Christ so much that he just in passion stuck with it. It wasn't that he just drummed up enough, I just, I just gotta, I gotta drum up enough faith to keep going. No, he just had so much passion for the truth of God and the need of the gospel. 
that he's going to be faithful, right? His faith proved itself in its love. I want to feed hungry, lost people so they can hear the gospel, right? I, 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 I just want to, I want, to, I want to listen to the frustrated political opponents of my world so that I can winsomely present a better kingdom than the one that any political system could come up with, right? I, you know, we, we're, we're going into a season where we're going to hear politics, 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 and we're going to get sick of hearing the opposing view from what we believe is the right view. But listen, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be willing to do that. <laughs> I'm going to suffer with the Apostle Paul because it might win me the opportunity to say, you know what? In the end, neither one of our political systems is going to be the answer to our deepest need. It's going to be Jesus Christ. It might win me the opportunity to share the gospel. But what, feeding a lost, hungry person might win me the opportunity to share Christ with them, even though I might be frustrated with the decisions they've made that led them to the problems and challenges that they have. Listen, Jesus chose these few based on their aptness, their availability, their passion, and their teachability. And we should do the same. The point of Coleman is, this is what Jesus was doing. When we talk about wanting to make a difference, to move the gospel forward, we need to, we need to practice the principle of selection. Who are we going to invest in as we attempt to make disciples? Choose people who are apt, available, passionate about the faith, passionate about gospel, passionate about Christ, and who are teachable. That's what we want to look for. And, and then, listen, here, here's the second thing I want us to talk about today. And that is this, the intelligence of focusing on a few. Jesus focused on a few. He selected a few. Uh, by the end of Jesus' ministry, you could say there might have been as many as, as 120 people that had gathered in the upper room. That, that are following Jesus. Uh, there, there's testimony in 1 Corinthians about 500 seeing his, uh, his, his resurrected state. So somewhere perhaps between 120 and 500 people could be counted as those who have begun to follow Jesus by the end of his earthly ministry. Right? And, and, and really that's significant in terms of the amount of space that he covered, the amount of time that he spent on the earth. That's still a significant thing. But it all happened through him selecting you. You had that number that were in the followers, but you had 12 that really had begun to pull away from the crowds from by his last year of ministry. He's pulling away from the crowds and he's investing in really 12 men. And we know one of those fell away. And of the 12 men he was investing in, we know that over and over and over again, there was three, Peter, James, and John, that get mentioned, that seem to be there in the critical moments, that seem to be part of these unusual and, and, and necessary things going on to understand fully what Jesus' plan is, what Jesus' mission is. He's focusing on a few. What's the intelligence of focusing on a few? Here's a quote from your book. Dr. Coleman wrote this, One cannot transform the world except as individuals in the world are transformed. You want to transform the world? you got to start by transforming individuals. Right? It's not about how many people can we get together at one time and then convince them of what we've got to do. No, start by transforming individuals. You want a different environment in your home? You want, you, is there something in your home that you go, Lord, I wish this would change. I wish this could be different. I, I wish this could occur in our home. Our, our home is not God honoring exactly to what you want it to be. It's not doing... Do you want something in your home to change? Well, start by looking at you, right? Are, are you available, passionate, and teachable? Are you, are you that individual? And then what about your wife? Where is she? What about one of your children, right? Uh, start with an individual or a few and see if the organization, the dynamic, the community of family doesn't change. Okay. What about your business? What about your fin friend gatherings? Right. What, what about your social groups or clubs? What about our nation? How, how do we change these things? The same principles. Same principles apply. We cannot transform any group, any organization, any community without the transformation of individuals. Select. Be selective. Focus on a few. Jesus focused on the few. So that as more followers were gathered, right, as God chose to open the harvest by selecting a few, there were people there to be leaders and examples for those that got gathered in in the harvest. 
Somebody's got to lead the way. Jesus cannot individually lead the way for 120 or 500 people, much less the millions and millions and millions that follow him today, right? You, yes, the power of the Holy Spirit working the lives of individuals, but the, the tactic of human relationships, disciple making by disciple making by disciple making, there needs to be a few. There needs to be leaders who are trained. So Jesus focused on a few. You know, if you look in the business world, uh, there's a big emphasis right now on leadership development. Almost all business organizations have some kind of leadership development track or leadership development school or, or leadership development organization that they'll send their people to. And, and look, they don't send everybody and they don't put everybody on that track, right? right, right at once. There's a few that get selected out, this person, this person. And you may be sitting there going, I wasn't selected. Why wasn't I selected? They selected that person. Why wasn't I? Not everybody can be selected at any given time, right? God has a plan and a path for you. God has a plan and a path for them. All right. So sometimes we're sitting there going, but what about? Uh, that's amazing to me in the disciples. There was arguments the disciples made. I don't know that there's any recording of the argument of them going, hey, Jesus, why are you always taking Peter, James, and John? Why not me? Why, why? Right. They just, they just understood and accepted. The mission meant focusing on a few. Discipleship works in the same way. We talk about these leadership, business school leadership plans and strategies, and, and we go, man, the church could learn something from the business world. No, 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 no. The world is practicing God's principles, even if they don't know it. And they didn't necessarily pick up the Bible and go, let's do leadership like the Bible does. No, if, it, if it's right and it's good and it works, it's coming from God's truth, right? They're borrowing from the Bible, not the other way around. We just need to wake up and go, you know what? Uh, if that's the way that this principle works, if God designed this principle, why aren't we doing it in the church? Why aren't there men gathering with a few others right, to bring them into a closer relationship with Jesus? Apt men, available men, passionate men, teachable men. In our desire for quick results and larger groups and faster growth, we often flip Jesus' strategy. Get big crowds. What can we do to draw a larger number? What, right, let's focus on a few. Train them for discipleship. And then as God opens the harvest, you have leaders and you have examples for the group. All right. I, I don't know how many men I've talked to over the years who have said, you know, I was saved as a child or as a teenager, but I never really had anyone disciple me. I've talked to so many men like that. I, I got saved when I was this age, and I, I, got, I got saved and baptized at this age, but I just never had any, any formal discipleship. I never had anybody to disciple me. I didn't have a Christian father in the home, or I didn't have a man in my church that kind of poured into me and invested in me. And I, I never had that. That's evidence, listen, that the church misunderstood the mission. And it's evidence that the church misunderstood Jesus' strategy. The mission is not more people. The mission is more disciples. And a disciple is someone who makes disciples. As the author pointed out, with all the advances in, in the ways to proclaim the gospel to the world, we have so many powerful tools to get the gospel to broader and broader and broader audiences. And with all those tools, there are more unevangelized people on the earth today than before the invention of the horseless carriage. If we flip Jesus' strategy upside down, it doesn't work. Now, there's a lot more in our chapter for you to, to look at, to think about, to digest, to apply. So hopefully you'll discuss some of those other things. But, but that's where I'm going to leave you today. Uh, men, uh, take this, take the reading, have good discussions, and uh, let's apply what we're learning by putting in practice the first principle, the principle of selection. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Thank you for these men that have gathered on this occasion. Pray that, Lord, you would use the material of this book, use the principles of our Savior to help us become more effective disciple-making disciples of Jesus. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.